What about the relationships between science fiction and fantasy and their changing um, uh, appeal, let us say, to mass audiences? Um, you have started out writing science fiction stories. Now you're known as a fantasy writer. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about you know, uh, the choices you make when you choose to write a story in one genre or, or the other and what relationships you think there are between them. And Stan, I'd like to hear a little bit about what you think those relationships are too. <clears throat> Well, that's an interesting subject. Yes, when I started out writing in the early 70s, I, I did a few fantasies early on. I published in fantastic uh, magazines, one of, the, one of the digest magazines of the day. But predominantly, I published in Analog and Amazing, and uh, uh, the magazines were identified as science fiction magazines. And I wrote a lot of stuff that were set on other planets um, with aliens and starships and all of that stuff. Um, I think a lot of that was not because I didn't, I preferred science fiction to fantasy. I loved them both. I mean, I, I grew up reading Robert A. Heinlein and uh, Andre Norton were two writers that I devoured in, in my childhood and early, early teenage years. Uh, but I also read Robert E. Howard and Tolkien for the fantasy, H.P. Lovecraft and horror. Uh, we didn't call it horror then, we called it monster stories. <coughs> I love my monster stories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And having read all this, I also wrote all this when I come of age. But in the, the 60s and the 70s, well into the 70s, there were far more markets for science fiction, particularly in the short story length. So that's predominantly what I write. I, I, and I love the worlds I created and some of the stories I told, I'm still very proud of. But I, you know, I look back on it now and saying, you know, I was writing fantasy all along. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not a hard science guy like Stan, uh, everything that I, know about science, I learned from science fiction stories. So, <laughs> um, my, my science fiction stories, if you, you know, look at them crookedly here, are really space fantasy. Um, I'm using aliens instead of elves or whatever. It's a, it's a furniture difference rather than a quantitative difference. <laughs> and I actually believe that uh, science fiction and fantasy are just two flavors of the same thing. I mean, one of them is chocolate ice cream and one of them is strawberry ice cream, but they're both ice cream um, and they taste really good. Uh, <laughs> now there are some people who don't believe that, who feel that they're completely opposite and indeed may even be in opposition to each other um, because science fiction is real and realistic and you know could possibly happen and fantasy is not. Um, which is a dubious proposition when yeah. you think about yeah. it because it doesn't hold up. Actually, there's far more evidence for the existence of ghosts than for hyperspace. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So why don't you tackle that? <laughs> <laughs> the border between science fiction and fantasy is so uh, permeable and interpenetrated that it can never be uh, teased out, and none of the ways that people try to do it actually work very well. Uh, uh, so it's a game that we play in our field, and some people will argue over it, and other people will realize that it, it can never be accomplished because uh, time travel is usually called science fiction, and yet it's a fantasy. And um, every night we are always uh, having about three or four fantasy novels run through our heads, which are our dreams, and those dreams are real. And so um, you could say that it's a kind of science fiction where, where you drop into your dreams every night. And there are other ways in which the borders are permeable. If you, if you set your story five million years in the future and there's humans involved, then you have this Clark's Law that any technology sufficiently advanced is indistinguishable from magic. Very true. Like your cell phone, it's magic. So we're already there, and the, the distinction between the two is more, uh, is, is unimportant except in publishing terms. And the, the guy who wrote the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction and the Encyclopedia of Fantasy, John Clute, writing almost every entry in both encyclopedias, if you can believe it, he suggests that we call it all fantastica to, to uh, distinguish it from domestic realism. And in trying to, instead of trying to make a distinction that can't be made between science fiction and fantasy, you accept that in fantastica, things that are happen that might not happen to you on the street tomorrow and yet are worth writing about and talking about. 
And in fact, my teacher here at UC San Diego, I was so lucky to have, Frederick Jameson, said to me once, it's clear to me, fantasy is about uh, pre-capitalist cultures, and science fiction is about capitalist or post-capitalist cultures. <laughs> and it works like a charm, actually. <laughs> uh, so it's a game you can play forever. I see. You see a lot of uh, that, that stigma we talked about, that science fiction and fantasy, but science fiction in particular was, was subliterary, was not real literature, mm -hmm. um, still has its influences, I, I think. And you see people um, denying that they write science fiction when obviously they are writing science fiction. I mean, um, Margaret Atwood, her uh -huh. classical case here where, where she denied no, no, I'm not a science fiction writer. There are no squids from space in my stories. Yeah. And, uh, you know, she had to be informed that squids from space are not actually necessary. Mm. Although, it's fun. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, and it crops up in the strangest places. I mean, they have, you know, during my television career at one point when Twilight Zone was winding down uh, and Star Trek The Next Generation was, uh, was just gearing up, I had an interview at Star Trek The Next Generation uh, for you know, a possible job as a staff writer. And I remember coming into the office of this producer, um, who thankfully did not last long on the show. And you can see where when I tell the story. And he said, well, I don't know, uh, I don't know who you are. Can you tell me your credentials? I said, well, I'm, I'm I, I just coming off Twilight Zone, where I, I worked for a while. But before that, I wrote novels and short stories. I'm, I'm primarily a science fiction writer. And he said, ah. Oh, really? Well, you know, um, Star Trek is, is not a science fiction show. It's, it's a people show. Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, oh, a, a people show. I was fooled by the photon torpedoes and the Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> I was misled. Uh, so needless to say, I didn't get that job after, you know, making shameless fun of this idiot. Uh, <laughs> but, um, yeah, these, these the crazy uh, denials that you get uh, just mean, you know, oh, I don't want to be, I don't want to be tarred with that brush, but the, the brush is outdated and, you know, the modern audiences, like I think most of the people in this room read all this with, uh, with great enthusiasm and don't think of it as a, even as a guilty pleasure or something so literary and hopefully that will go away in a few more years. Didn't Ursula K. Le Guin famously reply to Atwood that, you know, she was just afraid of being stuck in the literary ghetto and that her definition of science fiction didn't really make sense? That's what I'm remembering. I, I think she did, yes. Mm, yeah. Yeah.